The servant girl annihilator, also known as the Austin Axe Murderer, was active in Austin, Texas from December 1884 to December 1885. The annihilator's victims were mostly young, African-American women who worked as domestic servants. They were all attacked indoors while asleep in their beds, but five of them were dragged outside and killed outdoors, the reason for this remains unknown but it may have been because they were making too much noise or the houses had too many people in them, but these are only assumptions with no credible evidence. The annihilator not only murdered his victims but also sexually assaulted and mutilated some of his victims. Adding to the brutality of the murders, the killer would insert sharp objects in their ears. The annihilator would also attack anyone who was present during the murders, including friends, boyfriends, and husbands but sparing children if possible. In total, the annihilator killed eight people, attempted to kill six to nine known victims but was unsuccessful and assaulted two without killing them. The annihilator's first canonical victim was Molly Smith, who was killed on the night of December 30, 1884. Her boyfriend was also left severely injured from the attack. On March 19, 1885, Clara Strand and her friend, Christine Martinson, were attacked by an unidentified individual and severely wounded but both survived. On May 6, Eliza Shelley, a mother of three children, was attacked and brutally murdered. Days later, Irene Cross was attacked by a man with a knife, being stabbed multiple times and left to bleed to death. During the attacks, the servant girl annihilator interacted with two young boys but did not harm them. The first one was eight-year-old Douglas Brown, a nephew of Irene Cross, who declared that a big, chunky black man, barefooted and with his pants rolled up, had covered him with a blanket and told him to be quiet. He had no recollection of the murder, and it is speculated that the killer sedated him with chloroform stolen from a dentist's home. During the next month, Clara Dick was found severely injured, having survived an attack. The Annihilator's next victims were Rebecca Ramy and her daughter Mary, though Rebecca survived the attack, Mary was killed. In September 1885, a man attacked Gracie Vance, Orange Washington, and their friends, Lucinda Body and Patsy Gibson. Lucinda and Patsy survived the attack but were left severely injured, while Gracie and Orange died. The Annihilator's last known victims were murdered on the same night. They were identified as Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips. Eula's husband, James Phillips, was also attacked during the assault on his wife, but he managed to survive. Eula and James Phillips' two-year-old son Thomas Phillips, was sleeping with his parents and was given an apple by the killer. The crime scenes were so bloody that the population began to ask themselves if multiple individuals or gangs were responsible for the crimes. Bloody axes and sharp objects were often left behind at the crime scenes, along with bare footprints missing one toe. Several suspects were arrested but investigators were not able to connect any of them to the murders, which angered the public. Private detectives were hired to solve the case, but no one was able to identify the killer. The killing suddenly stopped after December 1885, when additional police officers and more professional investigators were hired. Because Susan and Eula were Caucasian women, the city demanded more attention to the case but despite all the efforts, the killer was never caught, and the case went unsolved. In an interview with the PBS documentary series History Detectives, Mark E. Safarik profiled the Annihilator as a young, muscular African-American male, likely in his early twenties, who acted alone and felt powerless in his daily life. He would not target Caucasian females in his early crimes because he considered them too risky, but after a string of successful murders, he was emboldened to do so. He would not stop killing on his own free will, therefore, 
he must have been prevented from continuing the crimes by an unrelated external reason, such as being incarcerated for another crime. The axe used by the perpetrator was left behind at the scene of the murder. Also left behind were the bare footprints of the perpetrator who forfeited his boots to enable his stealthy entrances and exits. During the investigations of the crimes, the authorities had carefully noted the footprints which were often blood-stained and had made distinct impressions in the soil as the perpetrator carried the weight of the victim. Apart from general measurements of size and shape, footprints in most instances are not especially distinctive and they would not have been much use to the authorities had they not possessed some unusual feature. But the footprints left behind at the servant girl murder crime scenes did share a very distinct feature, one of the footprints had only four toes. The authorities never shared this fact with the press or the general public during 1885. The press frequently complained about the secrecy surrounding the murder inquests and argued that making all the details of the crimes public would facilitate the capture of the responsible parties more quickly. The authorities disagreed and kept certain details of the cases to themselves, details that they hoped would eventually identify the perpetrator and link him to the crime scenes. The main suspect and most likely to be the annihilator were Nathan Elgin born in 1866 and died in 1886, shortly after the last murder and since his death, no other killing by the annihilator seemed to occur. Elgin was caught by police, as he was assaulting and nearly beating to death a young girl named Julia, and as they pulled him off her and tried to handcuff him he pulled out a knife but before he could attack he was shot and killed. After Nathan Elgin's death, the authorities unexpectedly had the direct physical evidence they had been waiting for, a foot that matched the distinctive footprint of the killer. But the foot belonged to a dead man. In the month since the last murders in December 1885, the city's police force had been tripled in size. A curfew had been enacted and private citizens had organized into patrols to guard the neighborhoods after dark. Strangers were forced to identify themselves or be evicted from the city. Saloons and other raucous downtown establishments, usually open 24 hours a day, were forced to close at midnight. A new era of law and order had begun. Maybe the authorities believed they had gotten lucky, they couldn't arrest, prosecute or convict Elgin, but perhaps the problem had been solved. While the authorities were not able to make use of the evidence against Elgin, the defense attorneys for James Phillips and Moses Hancock certainly were. Eula Phillips, wife of James Phillips, and Susan Hancock, wife of Moses Hancock, had both been murdered on December 24, 1885, and both husbands were subsequently charged with murdering their wives. In May 1886, during the trial of James Phillips, defense attorneys introduced into evidence floorboards marked with bloody footprints that had been removed from the Phillips house after the murder. They were compared to the footprints of the defendant, who removed his shoes and had his feet inked and printed in an elaborate demonstration in the courtroom. Even though Philip's footprints were substantially different in size than the bloody footprints on the floorboards, the jury was unconvinced. The motives of jealousy and drunkenness as argued by the prosecution convinced the jury and they found Philip's guilty of second-degree murder. When the case against Moses Hancock was finally brought to trial, the Hancock received some substantial legal help in the form of pro bono representation by John Hancock, no relation, a former U.S. congressman, one of the state's most prominent political figures and one of Austin's most astute legal practitioners. Also aiding the defense rather than the prosecution was Sheriff Malcolm Hornsby, who during his testimony described making a cast of Elgin's foot after his death, the significance of the missing toe, the similarities between Elgin's footprint and the footprints left at the Phillips and Ramy murders, and that fact that there had been no further servant girl murders committed since Elgin's death. 
Even so, the jury was not completely persuaded and after two days of deliberation, a hung jury was declared, and the case was discharged without a verdict. And that is how the case of the servant girl annihilator ends. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more make sure to like and subscribe.